Good evening, and thank you for coming. Many years ago, I worked at the Jefferson Market Library on 6th Avenue. My colleagues and I there were quite conscious of the fight wage just a few years earlier by Ruth Wittenberg and others to save that building. The Women's House of Detention was still very much in operation during my time at the library. Its demolition and replacement by a beautiful garden was another great victory for this community. There was no Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. We're lucky that the society exists today to help preserve the heritage of this very special community. So thank you. In 1984, Buddha Hagen and Herbert Berghoff wrote these words to Frank Hodsell, the chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts. We protest against the formalized lifeless quality of the present world ignoble in its rationalism, materialism, and calculating self-interest, and its lack of magnanimity toward true art and artists. We deplore the dull prudence of modern life, fostering vulgarity and disorder, diverting and corrupting inalienable rights to the fullness of life, and depriving the artists of service to their country and of their much-needed voice, the last best hope we have. As you can tell, Herbert and Uda were passionate people who held strong views. Since we are in the midst of celebrating HB's 70th anniversary, it's fitting for me to tell you a little bit about them. Actor, director, and master teacher Herbert Berghoff was born in Vienna in 1909. He attended the University of Vienna and the Vienna State Academy of Dramatic Art. For the next 11 years, Berghoff played more than 120 roles in Europe's leading theaters. He was directed by Max Reinhardt, Erwin Piscator, and Otto Preminger. Berghoff founded the Vienna Kleinkunstbühne and was their director from 1933 to 1938. After fleeing the Nazis in 1938, Berghoff emigrated to the United States. He worked as a teacher at Piscotter's Dramatic Workshop at the New School and at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Piscotter cast Berghoff as the fool in King Lear at the New School in 1940, after which Berghoff frequently appeared on Broadway. He performed in many of the Golden Age of Television dramatic series in the 1950s and on radio and in several movies. In 1956, on Broadway, Berghoff directed the American premiere of Waiting for a Godot, starring Burt Lahr and E.G. Marshall. He repeated the assignment in 1957 with an all-black cast, including Jeffrey Holder, Earl Hyman, Rex Ingram, and Mantan Moreland. H.B. studio alumni include such countless notables as F. Murray Abraham, Anne Bancroft, Matthew Broderick, Bill Crystal, Robert De Niro, Robert Culp, Sandy Dennis, Lee Grant, Jack Lemon, Anne Mira, Liza Minnelli, Geraldine Page, Charles Nelson Riley, Maureen Stapleton, Jerry Stiller, Edward Falella, and Fritz Weaver, to name but a few. <coughs> Michael Feingold wrote of Herbert in the Village Voice. His body, wizened or waddling, was unmistakably a character actor's. His voice suggested a temperamental frog, out of sorts from being wakened too early. When he smiled, the corners of his mouth seemed to turn up and down simultaneously, as if to convey the enormous number of schemes he had in mind for your discomfiture. <laughs> Yet if you look past all that, at Herbert Berghoff's eyes, what you saw was the large, dreamy, yearning gaze of a poet. For 52 years in America, as actor, director, teacher, or administrator, a poet is what Herbert Berghoff was and remained. Like a poet, he was often implausible and occasionally impossible. But he made up for his lapses, as poets do, by fixing his gaze on the sublime and declining to settle for anything less. That the country he adopted as his native land after fleeing the Nazis in 1938 had become over the last few decades of his life a diabolical machine for compelling artists to replace 
the sublime with the saleable, did not phase Bergkopf. Able to sustain himself with his teaching and an occasional movie and television appearance, he simply withdrew from the machine and confined his artistic abilities to the tiny building on Bank Street, where anything from monodramas to epics with casts of 20 or 30 could be performed without the interference of producers, agents, unions, critics, and other nuisances that have nothing to do with the art of the theater. <laughs> Gouda Hagen was born in Germany in 1919 and emigrated to the United States at the age of six when her father, a renowned art historian and musicologist, accepted a teaching position. Her first stage appearance was a high school production of Noel Coward's Hay Fever. Her first professional role was Ophelia to Eva Legallian's Hamlet, after which she made her debut on Broadway as Nina in The Seagull, appearing with the Lunts. She would later say how much she admired the Lunts, their passion for the theater, and their discipline. In 1946, she played Desdemona to Paul Robeson's Othello, with her then husband Jose Ferrer as Iago. She played Blanche in A Streetcar Named Desire on tour and occasionally stood in for Jessica Tandy on Broadway. That's Uda's daughter, Letty Ferrer, who works here at HB, visiting Uda backstage at Streetcar in Chicago. Uda starred in The Country Girl, for which she won her first Tony Award, and in 1963, Uta created the role of Martha in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, winning her second Tony Award. She made few films because of the Hollywood blacklist. Her later comment about the blacklist was, it kept me pure. Mm -hmm. When Herbert died in 1990, Uta became head of HB Studio and of HB's theater. Here, in her own words, is Uta's account of the move, move to Bank Street written in 1957. Herbert Burkhoff created the HD studio in 1945. In 1948, we were able to afford renting a number of small studios on Lower Fifth Avenue. In 1950, we made big progress when one of our students discovered a reasonable loft on 23rd Street. It was on the top floor, and there were many flights to climb, and it was very crude. But once you got up there, it was yours. If it rained while the class was in session, the roof leaked considerably, and each scene was accompanied by a bop, bip, bop, beep, bip, bop, as the water landed in the various buckets placed around for the purpose. Last year, this is 1956, one of Herbert's students said, I think I found a good building on Bank Street. We said, thanks a lot without much enthusiasm. A couple of days later, we decided to wander over to Bank Street to look at the building. It seemed nice enough, but we didn't hold out much hope because we had no idea what the financial deal entailed. We inquired, and our ears began to perk up. We needed either $40,000 in cash or money for two mortgages. Well, we had $16,000 in the bank, and probably could work out the mortgages over the years like rent. The taxes were low. Our architect friends looked at the building and said, a find. We're in, we hollered. Then the architect said, now let's see what has to be done to meet the building code requirements. We didn't even know what building code requirements were. We kept going back and forth to look at our building in all its glory. We got more excited every day and more impatient with the architects for delaying us and with the real estate agents who kept pressuring us to make up our minds because of other potential buyers. Herbert dreamed of an intimate theater on the first floor, a truly flexible small theater, a club theater riding on the back of the studio to stay both free as far as being paid or charging is concerned, a true artist's repertory. The students learn more quickly in conjunction with the experimental work, and we can use the talent we develop. The first news from the architects was marvelous. 120 Bank Street had unrestricted zoning. 
so both the theater and school were possible. In fact, we were told we could start a glue factory if we liked. <laughs> After careful work and survey, they had found that a lot of work needed to be done on the building before we would, we would be allowed to move in. I didn't want to go to loan and financing companies, very high interest. After that came trips to angels. I mistakenly thought that there were philanthropists around who would swoon at the idea of helping such a noble selfless venture. Our most startling discovery was that rich people don't have a lot of money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Their money is out being invested. You'd have to be more than a friend to lend us $25,000. You'd have to be nuts. And we just didn't know any rich nuts. One night, two of our students, Oliver Bellin and Tim McCready, dropped by. We were full to the brim with our disappointments and unloaded our problems on their sympathetic shoulders. Suddenly, Olga said, we'll get the money for you. Within a couple of days, we became aware that all kinds of rumblings were going on at the studio. We were asked to be present at a meeting to explain what we were after. There were 60 students there, most of whom had been members of the studio for at least a couple of years and had a specific idea of our way of work and at least some idea of our integrity. Herbert was terribly excited and started off the meeting by telling them how much he believed in them. I showed them our books so they couldn't think we were crooks. <laughs> Salaries, expenses, rents, etc. I showed them the blueprints of the building and gave them an exact breakdown of the money needed. I explained that we wanted a loan, not a gift, that we were unable to pay 12% or more to a loan company. Then Olga Bellin came out with the astonishing announcement that she had already raised $500, which was a lot of money in those days. The next day, the students brought in over $1,200. Nothing was ever ex as exciting as that first meeting. It was all so new and bubbly, the urgency, the strength, the sense of crusading, the emotionalism, the love for theater and an ideal the love for us and for each other. By July 28th, we had amassed over $16,000 and the sources were much more incredible than the amount. Over $1,800 of the total came in amounts of $1 or less. One had to weep. Herbert and I felt overcome with guilt. We started writing letters and phoning people. Hillard Elkins, the first person I called, said, yes, I nearly fainted. I know you can't read the names on this list, but Geraldine Page and Mildred Dunnock are there with generous contributions. And not that you need to know this, but at the bottom of the list, there's the name of Gertrude Macy, who was the most terrifying woman I ever met in my life. <laughs> Richard Rogers, Irene Selznick, Tennessee Williams, Eli Wallach, Jack Garfine, E.G. Marshall, Felicia and Leonard Bernstein, Catherine Cornell, Hal Prince, Kevin McCarthy, Maureen Stapleton, Fritz Weaver, Joshua Logan, so many artists sent loans or gifts. On July 28, 1958, we bought the building. What a fabulous, crazy day. Several months later, after a lot of work on the building, the opening party took place. 57 years later, everyone still pitches in at HB to help keep these buildings in shape, including our students who volunteer for our annual spring cleaning. Betsy Palmer wrote in 1980, those, to Uta, those mornings and early afternoons spent with you and all the lovely souls in our class has been a beautiful time in my life. That which pours forth for you is so life-giving and supportive that each of us walks away with a bit of you inside of us. What a great gift for you and for those of us touched by you. I hope, even though it looks as though I shall be spending some of my life west for a while, that I will always be considered a student of the Berghoff studio. Two years before she died, H.B. produced and released Uta Hagen's acting class, 
a two DVD set shot over two years featuring Buddha's work with students. Here's a very brief clip. When I go to the theater, if I can see the acting, I already don't like it. In other words, if it's the performer and his mind and his speculations and what he fixes and arranges is visible to me, it's bad acting, in my opinion. When I believe that there's a human being in action up there, in that moment, alive, right there and then, I get spellbound. Now, to achieve that is, to me, harder than playing an instrument. It's harder than fiddle, than, uh, it's harder than dancing, it's harder than all the other performing arts, in my opinion. When you really achieve that understanding of human beings, that ability to place yourself into the, into the shoes of another human being and reveal that life on stage, to me, the ultimate experience. When I first began, Herbert had a studio and he said, why don't you join us? I said, first of all, I was 27 years old. I said, I don't know how to teach. And he said, you know how to act, share what you have learned. Well, that was to me such a wonderful way of approaching it. I'll tell you a funny story. I played once uh, the streetcar with Marlon Brando without any rehearsal to standing room only audience because uh, uh, he was already then totally undisciplined and, <laughs> and taking a uh, two weeks vacation and during which I played with Tony Quinn and then he was supposed to come back from his vacation we were going to rehearse and then we were going to play. So he arrived five minutes after half hour was called. <laughs> This, the producer said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, to, and I said to Marlon, you want to try five minutes and see what happens? He said, <laughs> he said I'm game. And I said, OK. And we rehearsed about five minutes. And I thought, oh, I think this will, might work. He had never seen me. I had never seen him. We really had totally, I had a totally different interpretation than Jessica. And he had a totally different layout than, than, than Quinn. It worked like a charm. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it was rather uh, uh, unnerving. But and why it worked was that we had both rehearsed and played a lot in that set. With those optics, we never lost circumstances. I, I'm very attuned to my partner, no matter if I've played with him a long time or a little time, I will be tuned in. And it, it worked. Now, that can only work if circumstances, relationship, place, every tiny object is familiar to me. Kim Hunter, who lived on Commerce Street, by the way, originated the role of Stella in A Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway and played the role in the movie. I worked with Kim a few times and asked her who was the best Blanche, knowing that she'd acted with Jessica Tandy and Vivian Udo, she replied. Herbert Burkhoff's address to students often included the following statement. Remember the theater is a noble instrument of enlightenment to entertain, to bring poetry, better understanding of life, and spiritual help to your audiences. Be a good artist and aware that you are aspiring to become a member of a noble art and profession. Behave accordingly on stage and off. Don't create private tension of any kind that will set back the work as a whole. Given Herbert's serious approach to theater, you may wonder why we're showing a slide from Cleopatra, <laughs> a film that represented the personification of commercialism. Vanity Fair article, April 2011. When Liz Met Dick. Cleopatra was an extraordinarily botched production that had cost 44 million, an unheard of sum for 1963. Everyone knew that Cleopatra had nearly gutted the studio that made it 20th Century Fox. 
everyone knew that it had taken two directors, two separate casts, two Fox regimes, and two and a half years of stop start filmmaking in England, Italy, Egypt, and Spain to get the damn thing done. Above all, everyone knew that Cleopatra had given the world Liz and Dick. <laughs> The adulterous pairing of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, irresistibly cast as Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Never before had celebrity scandal pushed so far into global consciousness, with Taylor Burton preempting John Glenn's orbiting of the earth <laughs> on tabloid front pages, denunciations being sounded on the Senate floor, and even the Vatican newspaper publishing open letter that excoriated Taylor for erotic vagrancy. And yet, out of all of that, the H.B. Playwrights Theater was born. Saturday, July 21st, 1962, City Desk, this is from a New York newspaper. The July issue of Actors' Equity magazine carries the article, Moscow Drama Critics Review the New York Theater. It gives their impressions of some shows they saw. Of Herbert Berghoff's work and Samuel Beckett's Crap's Last Tape, one of the critics says, Berghoff is one of the greatest artists of the contemporary American stage, a master of many talents. His range is from Ibsen to musical comedy, a magnificent actor. Apparently, that's what Joe Mankiewicz thought, too. He wanted Berghoff for the role of the philosopher in Cleopatra and offered him four weeks' work. Berghoff didn't feel like doing the film and requested a large flat fee. Mankiewicz countered with a big heist in the salary per week. Instead of four weeks, the stretch turned into 42 weeks. <laughs> It enabled Berghoff to pay off the mortgage on his building. <laughs> From sources, Uda's biography. In 1961, my husband got an offer to be in a film called Cleopatra. The site was Italy. Before it ended, our great Roman holiday had spanned the months from late September to mid-May. It satisfied our dream of visiting Europe arm in arm. Thanks to the generosity of 20th Century Fox, we lived like kings on the per diem. The salary went straight into the bank, eventually buying a small theater for our studio. The theater opened, this theater opened in 1965 with an ambitious program of productions and readings. Early offerings included plays by Saul Bellow, Norman Rostin, and Tennessee Williams. For a quarter of the century, the theater was Berghoff's baby. He produced, directed, or encouraged the production of hundreds of productions. His motto was, the writer for the theater must be nourished and allowed to experiment without the demand that he be certain of the direction toward which the experiment will move. In later years, H.B. branched out and presented a wide variety of programs, including St. George and the Dragon, an annual Christmas play for children. We don't have a lot of photos from the early years, but to give you an idea of the richness and complexity of the work that has taken place on this stage, here are a few photos from recent productions. Had a gobbler. The three sisters. The master and Margarita. And the lady from the sea. Many plays grow out of our HB Playwrights program. A notable feature of our calendar is our annual festival of 10 minute plays each created around a theme. Each program features eight 10-minute plays by different HB studio student playwrights who are in our classes. The 
these are the Central Park plays because this year's theme was Central Park. Each play used is pretty much the same set with some adjustments, but they they were all focused on the theme of, of Central Park. And this is an annual production, although the title theme changes. Amy Wright, an actress and director on our faculty, was in the original production of Lanford Wilson's play, The Fifth of July. Wilson actually created the role for her. Amy's commitment to the work of Lanford Wilson continues at HB. Two years ago, she directed HB students in the Rhymers of Eldridge. Last year, she directed students in Palm and Gilead. These plays could not be done commercially today without a lot of expense. With the, the complexity of the cast, the innovation, innovative uh, scripts, and the number of, of actors required. And this is Palm and Gilead. Both of those plays, which premiered at La Mama in the 1960s, use unconventional theatrical devices and provided our students with the opportunity to play challenging roles in front of a live audience, guided by a director, Amy Wright, well-versed in this special material. Earlier this year, Amy directed The Butter and Egg Man, the only play that George S. Kaufman wrote without a collaborator. The Butter and Egg Man took place not in this space, but in our first floor studio next door where projects sometimes funded by grants from NISCA and the NEA support work in the early stages of development. We seek and receive grants on occasion which contribute to the richness of the school's curriculum as well as to our programs. Last year we received a grant from the Noel Coward Foundation which enabled HB to present a series of, a series of events related to Noel Coward. Austin Pendleton offered two workshops on acting Coward. Helen Gallagher taught a master class in Coward songs. Jeffrey Johnson, who worked with Noel Coward, moderated a panel featuring actors who have performed in Coward's plays, including Brian Murray, Marsha Mason, and others. And Jack Hofsis directed a performance lab on Coward's play, Design for Living. The series made possible by the Coward Grant is typical of what we do here. Synchronicity between coursework for our students as well as programs for our larger, larger community, which includes you. Mr. Hofsis made two, use of two distinctive HB spaces to present Design for Living. Act one took place in our studio next door. At intermission, a violinist Pied Piper played the audience into this space where Acts 2 and 3 were presented.
from the Frederick Lowe Foundation has made possible several upcoming projects related to musical theater, including a conversation about Pal Joey and one about Agnes DeMille. I hope you'll come back to hear those. An important part of our program is our People Who Make Theater series, featuring talks and panel discussions. Here are a few of, our, of the participants. Playwright and HB master teacher of playwriting, Donna DiMatteo, Renee Taylor, Austin Pendleton, Victor Slezak, Andre Gregory, Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson, Annie taught here for many years, Edward Morehouse, one of HB's master teachers, and Fritz Weaver and Rochelle Oliver, whom you'll meet shortly. Throughout the 1950s and early 1960s, Gordon Foote was best known for his teleplays and for the screenplay for To Kill a Mockingbird. By the mid-1960s, he was, according to his biographer, having a crisis of the soul. He was thinking of giving up writing, but his wife told him in no uncertain terms that he would continue to write. Around that time, Herbert Berghoff, who had been an admirer of Foote's work, asked him about turning his teleplay of Faulkner's Tomorrow into a stage play. Foote had met Berghoff a few times, but did not know him well. But he had great respect for his theatrical instincts and directorial ability, and was an admirer of Uta Hagen. Foote agreed to let him do it. For the two main characters, Berghoff cast Olga Bellin for Sarah and Robert Duval as Jackson Fentry. The play was presented on this stage in 1968. Foote and his family came down from New Hampshire to see it. Foote admired what Duval did with the character of Jackson Fentry. Duval brought a depth to the backwoodsman that went beyond what Richard Boone had done in the television version. Foote was also impressed by Olga Bellin. A young actor who played one of the smaller parts in that production was Romulus Linney, later himself a playwright and the father of Laura Linney. The trip to see the play provided the opportunity for the whole Foote family to spend a weekend in the city. The outing had a lasting impression on 11-year-old Daisy and inspired her to become a writer. Years later, Foote encouraged her to take a course with Herbert Bergman. Her first play, The Villa Capri, was produced here. <clears throat> Daisy Foote was not the only budding artist to draw inspiration from H.B.'s production of Tomorrow. David Mamet, then an acting student, and Robert De Niro, a struggling actor, saw both performances, and years later told Foote it had been one of his most moving experiences. A few years later, Foote sent three plays, Courtship, Valentine's Day, and 1918, to Herbert Berghoff, asking Herbert if he would consider doing one of them at HP. Berghoff responded that he'd like to do all three of them. It was around that time, spring 1978, that Foote and his wife Lillian sublet a small apartment near HB. During their years in Greenwich Village, they lived on Waverly Place, 10th Street, and Horatio Street. Foote's biographer, Wilborn Hampton, describes this theater as a long, narrow room with a cement floor. 99 seats are arranged on risers at one end, and the stage is at the other end. It was listed as an off-off Broadway house, and under its arrangement with Actors' Equity, productions were limited to only 10 performances, two weekends and the week in between. Nobody got paid, neither actors, nor directors, nor playwrights, and critics were not invited. Hampton goes on to say, Courtship opened on July 5th, 1978. If any date could be cited to represent the start of Foote's second career, it would probably be that one. As it happened, New York, New York was in the middle of a torrid heat wave, and the little HB theater had no air conditioning. Somehow, actors and audience both survived, and the production played to capacity houses throughout its brief run. 
Audiences were not so enthusiastic that Berghoff, no, I'm sorry, audiences were so enthusiastic <laughs> that Berghoff immediately asked for to direct both of the other plays he had sent him, one in each of the next two seasons. In all, at least 10 plays by Horton Foote were presented here. One of them, In a Coffin in Egypt, was first presented to the world on this stage in 1980 with Sandy Dennis. It received its first commercial production in 1998 at the Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor, starring Glynis Johns. Hallie Foote read an excerpt from it at her father's memorial service in 2009. Last year, 2014, an operatic version starring Frederica von Stade received its world premiere at the Houston Grand Opera, after which it toured to Philadelphia, Chicago, and Beverly Hills. And just this month, by coincidence, the Dramatis, the Dramatist Play Service announced a new publication of the acting edition. But it all began right here on this stage. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce two artists who have contributed so much to the American theater and who have a long, distinguished history with HB Studio. Please welcome Michelle Oliver and Fritz Weaver. Jesse. The place is Egypt, Texas, the year 1968. The we are sitting, we are in the sitting room of the house Myrtle came to as a bride. The house is surrounded by cotton fields and is part of a vast plantation. Myrtle is seated in the wing chair looking out the window and listening to the singing which comes from the nearby black church. I remember that night so well. How many years ago? It was a Sunday night, and across the fields, I could hear the Negroes singing in their church. None of us ever went to church here in this house. Hunter had no religion, one found in the churches in Glen Flora or Harrison. Can you hear the Negroes singing? I never cared for their singing myself. I am not sentimental about Negroes and their religion, as many whites I know of. No, I don't dislike Negroes. Some I like and some I don't like. Just as some whites I like and many, very many, I don't like. <laughs> well, I know I'm supposed to be bitter toward the Negro race because of the colored mistress Hunter had as a young man. <laughs> a young man. He preferred colored women until he was 45 and then he changed. Why did you change, I once asked him. The change almost cost him his life. But from the time he was 45 on, he only took white mistresses. Common and vulgar, mostly, they were, too. I always thought the mulatto of Maude Jenkins was the most beautiful, and in some ways the most refined, although when she left him for the gambler, she ran a house of prostitution, the bank, across the tracks in Harrison. She has a house in California now, someone said, left for there after the gambler was killed. She's gotten fat, they say, and lost her look. I only saw her twice when she was a girl, and she was a beautiful lady, copper color. She looked like the Tahitian girls in Gauguin pictures. She was a Jenkins, more Jenkins. Her mother was the mistress of Cy Merriweather, and so she was his child, they say. She was some white man's child, that's for sure. 
God refused to live on here and be humiliated while he lived openly with his mulatto woman, who he once told me he loved better than his wife, who he wrote love letters to. Love letters that she would read aloud when she was drunk to the young white boys in Harrison that came to her house of prostitution. Anyway, I went to Europe because of her. I took my two girls and stayed eight years over there traveling around from city to city. When I was in Algiers, a sheik fell in love with me and wanted me to divorce Hunter and marry him. He was dark complected, and my girls thought he was a colored man. Well, he was African, of course, and perhaps he did have colored blood somewhere down the line, as they say. Anyway, we traveled all over. Paris, Rome, my girls took ballet lessons. In New York, I met Mr. Froman, and he wanted to put me on the stage. I was a close friend of Lily Cahill's sister, and Lily was sweet to me when I was in New York. Uh, Lily Cahill is an actress, but was an actress, she's dead. She died of a broken heart in San Antonio, Texas, because she couldn't get a job in New York acting anymore. And she came home at the age of 65 to her sister in San Antonio, Texas, and tried to start an acting company of some kind, but San Antonio was in the throes of all that mess about unpatriotic books being in the public libraries. And Lily said, what you had to go through in San Antonio, Texas, to put on a play was worse than 10 Broadways. She died broke, they say. Proud, but broke. Anyway, I was gone a long time. New York, London, Paris, Rome. And then I came home. I took my girls and came home. So I never know why. But home I came. And it's like I was never, never away. It's like that person those two young girls floating around Europe, around Africa, was someone I read about or was told about. Someone I knew once a long time. on the occasion of Herbert's death. What Herbert meant to me as a friend and fellow artist is almost impossible to put into words. I've known and admired him for almost as long as I can remember, but our special bond came at a most important time in my life. His encouragement and belief in my talent and his staging of my plays at the studio I felt made possible everything that has happened to me since. And now I'd like to ask Rochelle and Fritz, who knew Borden Foot, for some memories of working with him here and knowing him as a man and a playwright. Well, I, I uh, met Borden uh, in uh, 1978. Uh, he was. This play, was, uh, the uh, Night Seasons, was being directed by, was going to be directed by Herbert. And Herbert came up to the studio, and uh, I, can't, I can't imagine he took me out of my, my class teaching. Uh, I think it was that I was, I was in Uta's class. Um, uh, I, was, uh, I had studied with Uta when I was 17, not here on 23rd Street. And, uh, we, we were neighbors in the village, and one day in the elevator, I told her I was standing by for a play on Broadway, and she said, why don't you come back to class? So I came back to class, and I think that's where Herbert retrieved me from, and brought me down here to this theater, and 
down the stairs and around and into this theater, came down this aisle, and right there between the edge of the stage and those seats, they were different than the other seats, was the striking gentleman with his horse foot. And Herbert introduced me uh, to Gordon, who immediately uh, made me at ease with his very generous smile and his warmth. And that began a blessed journey of friendship and work with, with Gordon Foote, who was keen eye and intelligence and watchfulness um, infused everything and I did for him. I, I don't really remember auditioning for it. I may have been up on the stage auditioning or down there and <laughs> auditioning with someone, but I knew that on the spot I was uh, given the part of Laura Lee Weaves in, uh, in uh, the night seasons, and it was, it was incredible, it was incredible. Um, that was uh, the first time I'd ever worked on this stage. Uh, courtship had already been done here, but uh, after that I did um, I did Valentine's Day in 1918, I played, in which I played Horton's grandmother, and we made three films from that in Texas, and we worked in Texas and Mississippi. The other play of Horton's that I had done here was uh, The Habitation of Dragons on the stage, Again, wonderful set, beautiful set. And the thing I remember about the set that I love so much that was right over here on stage left. Um, it, was, it was a room in, in our house. And oh, also I would come down this aisle to make an entrance in one of the scenes with uh, my son, Victor, Victor Slezak. And I remember even preparing for the scene. I was coming from a, a cemetery where my two grandchildren just been buried, they had drowned. And I came up, and I came up here, and then I had the scene with Victor, and at one point, uh, in that play, uh, maybe it was after that scene, we had, we had, what I loved, was we had a um, screen door and steps. And um, so everything was raised a bit. Um, and I remember how that served the play and it served me as an actor uh, so wonderfully, just emotionally and physically, to have that behavior of <laughs> going out that screen door and having the privacy with nobody there, of sitting on those steps. Yes, and it was just, it was just wonderful. It was beautiful. And then the last play um, I did of course was, it wasn't here, um, it was an EST, and it was a, a traveling lady, and it, that was the last, the last time I'd ever seen him um, uh, before he died. Uh, he gave me a call uh, and asked me to get in touch with a man named Marion Castleberry, who had directed the play in, uh, in, in Texas, in Baylor, uh, from the University of Texas and, um, he thought there was a part there for me, Gordon did, that would be just right. And uh, I got in touch with Marion, and I did, uh, we, did, we did that play. And after one of the performances, celebrated Horton's 90th birthday. And uh, it was, uh, his, his plays were always wonderful. wonderful to work on. Um, and uh, then I, I directed a play. Yes, you directed The Chase, which we've just seen some slides of. But you know, I think I forgot to mention something because I assumed it was obvious, but I should mention it. I said that Horton came down from New Hampshire with his family to see the production of Tomorrow. And obviously, In a Coffin in Egypt took place in Texas. Horton was definitely a Southern writer. I think you probably knew that. Though he lived in New Hampshire and in New York. In fact, um, he grew up in Texas. But you may not know that his son owned the Jane Street Tavern for many years, until quite recently. And yeah, before he came to, to, uh, to see um, the chase, 
Holocaust. This was 2009. Yeah. After Horton had died, HP continued its connection with, with his work that was so much a part of our heritage here, and Rochelle directed this, this play. Yeah, and it was the first I had directed some uh, some of the 10 minute plays um, on the stage. Um, I had done readings on the stage. I had never before directed a, a, a full length play. And it was a huge cast. And it was just, uh, just God, what an experience that was. And about the stage, which um, Horton's biographer uh, uh, described as a, this, I mean, this theater, the narrow and the concrete. Well, it's changed since then. Uh, but but I, what was so wonderful was with the help of uh, Giovanni Bellavi was his last name, right? He was uh, the stage manager who did the sound. He helped me find the music. Uh, I think it was Blessed, uh, Blessed, I can't remember now. And, and uh, he also built the set. And as on Broadway, the set was that if any of you had seen the movie or ever seen the play, the set was the sheriff's uh, office, and the set was the bleak cabin on this side where the convict had gone to visit his woman who was living with somebody else. And um, we managed to create, here it is, a big, big, big cast. Uh, a, some, Thing that moved from one side to the other when, when the, the, this when the office was uh, we were playing they were playing in the office this was covered and this was and, and the best I think you can see um, well in the in the ones in, at the end of the play after um, Bubba is shot uh, just the, we use the whole the whole width of the stage going way back. And it was just uh, an amazing um, challenge to uh, choreograph all of that. And uh, it was very exciting. It was a triumph, I will say. Your debut was overwhelming. <laughs> Rich, do you have any memories? Before we move on to uh, Mr. Lowell, do you have any memories of Horton Foot you'd like to share? Oh, well, I knew uh, Horton so well because of Herbert. And the contrast between these two men was incredible. He was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Herbert and he Hunt. did his uh, allegiance to the uh, emperor. And uh, Horton in a small southwestern town in Texas. But they recognized something in each other that was, oh, I can only say it was universal. They knew each other very well from the very start. And each could read the other's thoughts. And I, I just was astounded to see the two of them working together because it seemed like uh, an impossible union of two thousand. Thank you. The poet Robert Lowell was born in 1917 into a patrician, patrician Boston family that traced its roots back to the Mayflower. Rooted in New England Protestantism, Lowell also had Jewish ancestors on both sides of his family. He later converted to and then away from Catholicism. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1947 and also served as Poet Laureate at that time. He has been called the last of America's influential public poets. In 1943, in response to a draft notice, Lowell wrote to FDR, Dear Mr. President, I very much regret that I must refuse the opportunity you offer me for service. <laughs> As he did not claim religious reasons for his conscientious objection, he was in prison for several months. In 1965, 
as part of his refusal to attend a White House Arts Festival and in order to protest foreign policy, Lowell issued this statement in, a, in an open letter to President Johnson. We are in danger of imperceptibly becoming an explosive and chauvinistic nation. We may even be drifting on our way to the last nuclear run. Lowell's letter was published on the front page of the New York Times. The following day, the Times published a follow-up 20 writers and artists endorsed poet's rebuff of the president. Johnson was furious, calling the group a bunch of fools and sons of bitches and half-baked traitors. In 1967, at the height of LBJ's escalation of the Vietnam War, Lowell wrote a prose adaptation of Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound. In his play, Aeschylus depicts Prometheus as a rebel and bringer of progress to humanity. His Zeus, who does not appear as a character, is presented as a friendless tyrant. In Lowell's version, Zeus, clearly a metaphor for President Johnson, sits in the heaven of his assurance and our folly, free to play with his thunderbolts, each day another sublime crash of fireworks, another mountain range broken beyond repair. In late 1972, Herbert Berghoff, also a vehement critic of the Vietnam War, wrote to Robert Lowell, who was then living in England, Dear Mr. Lowell, would you consider entrusting us for our small theater, your Prometheus Bound? We don't charge admission. The actors, designers, and directors, and technical staff receive no salaries, and critics are not invited. Fritz Weaver, Uta Hagen, and Mike Kellen have agreed to play Prometheus, Eo, and Ocean, respectively. I hope to interest equally skilled actors for Hermes, Force, Power, Hephaestus, and the Three Seabirds. Lester Polakoff, who designed Member of the Wedding on Broadway, will do the sets and costumes, and I will direct it. If you should feel to inclined to give us permission to perform Prometheus, about 10 times. With my very best from Buddha and myself, yours truly, Herbert Berghoff. Permission was granted. The performance is played here to standing room only. In response to Herbert's second letter, in which he sent photographs of the production, Lowell wrote, Photographs are mysterious when they are not reminders of a play we have seen, but yours seem full of kick, artifice, and realism. Our London Prometheus was unbound, partly because no lead actor wished to be tied for two hours. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you, Uta and Fritz, for giving my play life. Our Prometheus is with, her, with us this evening. Fritz, before we conclude our program with your monologue from the play, can you tell us something about your experience working on the production? Well, we were, we were all rebels. Lowell had been a, a conscientious objector to the Second World War. I had been a conscientious objector to the Second World War. And Herbert Burkhoff bringing his own special baggage of having fled from Nazi Germany. I remember talking to Uta at that time. I just finished doing a, a movie in Vienna. And I said we had filmed in a concentration camp outside of Vienna called Mauthausen. And Uta said, oh, for God's sake, don't tell Herbert about that. His parents were murdered at Mauthausen. And it was true. And I think he brought that particular sense of the tyranny that had destroyed his family. And with Lowell and me both as rebels, it was a I quite a combination of things. And uh, I remember Herbert saying with great emotion, it is all, he said, it is all mismanagement. <laughs> and he stuck his words out like, and you knew that his view of Zeus was that Lyndon Johnson, and we, we were angry people, all of us, we were angry. I, I 
can almost relive those moments again. Uh, when we were, we were furious, we walked around. When, when I was in the, sitting in my kitchen one morning, uh, and it was the day on which a great march had been prepared in Washington to protest the Vietnam War. And on the radio came Lyndon Johnson's voice saying, we will, the FBI will be watching very closely to see who comes to Washington today. Instantly, I and I kissed my wife goodbye and said, I'm going to Washington. I want him to see me. That's how angry we were about the Vietnam War. Well, anyway, that was Zeus. And I, I will read you the Two questions before, yeah. before you give us the monologue. Okay. Uh, as, as Lowell says in his letter that the Prometheus found in London was not so successful because the Prometheus refused to be found. Yeah. So you were found, as we can see. How did that feel? And also just talk a little bit about working with Uta, what you did in that production. Well, Uta was very special always for me. Uh, she would start a scene and then she would say, no, but I can't finish the scene having started so badly. <laughs> and he'd say, well, but we, we must step on with the rehearsal. And she said, I know, but I can't go on until I start it and do it properly. And he said, but Fritz is waiting here. He wants do his part. <laughs> he said, I don't care. <laughs> and then he did it again. And she did it again. This time, she did it. I was in tears and unable to go on. <laughs> it was finished. But that's what the kind of actress she was. She, I loved her. Before I married this lady, <laughs> I loved her with a passion. And, uh, and was it was it difficult to be bound? Yes, it was. One of the, of the girls, Jill O'Hara, I think it was, was fluttering around on, on as a bird surrounding me, uh, bound in chains, and she had to sit on this pipe for. Uh, what seemed like hours at the dress rehearsal. She finally said in a still, small voice, you know her, but she said, my little Connie is very tired from sitting on this night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's uh, what it was like. <laughs> it was very hard indeed. But, um, but it was liberating too, because the hell just changed and it made you feel like Prometheus. Well then, that, with that in mind, <laughs> give us Prometheus. Though it was many years ago that I did this. And it was 1973, actually. Yes, and I was much younger and, uh, well, anyway. <laughs> I, I, I tried always to remember who Zeus was. Zeus was Lyndon Johnson. This is Prometheus. I will tell you about the feverish miseries of man. Before he could reason, he was an animal, perhaps the slowest and least graceful, a skull with less inside it than the shell of a turtle. I'm not saying this in scorn of men, but to show the greatness of their change. Men had eyes and saw nothing, a shapeless presence, a threatening absence, nearness seeming so distant that it hit them in the eyes, distance seeming so near they tried to duck their heads. No finer shades. They saw little in between the blinding yellow of the sun and the blank of night. They had ears and heard nothing. 
a splatter a splash, fizzing, buzzing, hissing, mazes of muddled vibration, sounds without the cutting edge of words. What did men know? Houses built of brick and turned to face the sun. They swarmed <coughs> like ants, though with far less order through a sunless underground of eroding holes. Leafless winter flowering spring and fruitful summer were all one season to them. The stars looked down on them like an aimless sprinkle of water drops running out into nothing. <coughs> I will tell you, they swarmed like ants. I taught men the rising the setting of the stars. And from the stars I taught them numbers. I taught women to count their children and men to number their murders. I gave them the alphabet. Before I made men talk and write with words, knowledge dropped like a dry stick into the fire of their memories, fed that fading blaze an instant, and then died without leaving an ash behind. Now, the brute forces of the earth obey men slavishly whenever he thinks and speaks. I have put animals under his thumb. Dog, cat, and cow, horses to plow, horses to saddle, horses to harness to the warrior's chariot. And while the animals drudge, man sits thinking so idly and so profoundly that he can hardly be troubled to budge and sort out the wealth and luxury that drops in his lap from me. Men were floating in boats, a pole to push, an oar to pull, a sail to hoist. Oh, those windy sails! Men thought I'd turned a block of wood into a bird. All these inventions were given to men. Thousands more followed. I could turn anything into anything. Man's short life, when I first looked at it, short as it was, was a long disease. Man was an animal without an animal's resolution for going on. If a man sickened, he would usually die. Nobody mixed medicines, brought cooling drinks, or knew what food to choose. I searched the earth and discovered it was a map of cures, covered up, mislaid, rotting, but eagerly waiting. A cure was waiting like a bride for every disease. But perhaps man couldn't have faced living out his life if death had abandoned him. I stopped teaching cures. I taught men to see into the future. What future they had was as close as death, but not so certain. They had dreams, some true, some false, some, I think. I think I taught them which were true. They heard voices in dreams, awake, anyway. I made men listen. Then they understood what those modest, seeping sounds were trying to tell them. There were signs at every step along man's way, yet he was trampling them down, hurting himself because he couldn't read their message. Look, you, you cannot see it. A vulture is swinging near, near to us from the distant sky, crooked, taloned, fat, with an empty stomach. He seems to have found us out. It might be our release. Man would know, I taught him. I taught him the feuds, the hungers, the lusts of birds, and why they gather. I made men stare into the entrails of beasts, see their smoothness, roughness. Each had a meaning. See what kind of gall would please the gods. See that the speckled symmetry of the liver lobe had meaning. The thigh bones swimming in fat, the long spines jointed like these chains. Everything in animals, even their excrement, meant something. Their innards would be correctly set on fire to appease the gods. 
I made men look into the fire. Alone and bemused in the slothful dark, they studied the fire's whirling and consuming colors and believed that they would someday taste the breath of life. No one knows, and I haven't told anyone the many wonders I have invented. Everything man knows. A black cloud is moving toward me. It's as hard as sheer rock. Soon my voice will be lost in the sound of breakage. I see Zeus. His hands are not tied. I am burning in my own fire. O Earth, my Holy Mother, look, you will see her suffer.